So, good morning. Um, just for certainty, I'm John. And that's Wendy. <laughs> Welcome to Toronto and to the Toronto Region Area of Concern, which is so shown on the screens in front of you. I think this picture illustrates quite well the environmental improvements that have occur occurred on Toronto's waterfront. This is a view of the city that many visitors and residents don't get to see. Some residents might even say this image was photoshopped believing the lakefront is still a horribly polluted place, but they'd be wrong. The real story is that conditions here and in other AOCs around the Great Lakes have improved substantially. And this morning, Wendy Carney and I are gonna tell you about some of the recent highlights in restoring Great Lakes areas of concern. Wendy. In 1987, the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement, uh, the United States and Canada committed to identify and work toward the elimination of areas of concern, which were defined as geographic areas that fail to meet the general or specific objectives of the agreement, where such failure has caused or is likely to cause impairment of beneficial use, and a remedial action plan was to be implemented in each area towards the restoration of these impaired beneficial uses. As you can see, this definition was made more specific in the 2012 agreement, but the focus remains the same. Implementing remedial action plans that contain objectives and criteria towards the restoration of beneficial uses. So what are these beneficial uses? 14 beneficial uses are identified in the water quality agreement and are shown in this slide. Impairment of, of beneficial use is defined as a change in chemical, physical, or biological integrity sufficient to cause one or more of the environmental, human health, or economic impacts. So there are human health beneficial use impairments like restrictions on fish consumption, economic beneficial use impairments like restrictions on dredging activities, and environmental beneficial use impairments such as loss of fish and wildlife habitat. These are addressed in each area of concern through a remedial action plan and when environmental monitoring demonstrates that impaired beneficial uses have been restored, the respective federal government can, after consulting with inter interested parties, delist an area of concern. As illustrated in these pictures, many of the beneficial uses of the waters of the Great Lakes were in pretty bad shape back in the 1970s and 1980s, which led to the identification of areas of concern in 1987, when the parties identified a total of 43 areas of concern on the Great Lakes, 12 in Canada, 26 in the United States, and five shared between the countries. Progress is being made. Four areas of concern in the United States have been delisted, with the most recent being White Lake and Deer Lake in 2014, to go along with Presque Isle Bay in 2013, and Oswego River in 2006. Three areas of concern have been delisted in Canada, Wheatley Harbor in 2010, Severin Sound in 2003, and Collingwood Harbor in 1994. There are also two areas of concern and recovery in Canada, Jackfish Bay and Spanish Harbor, where all actions have been completed, but more time is needed uh, for the environment to recover. But as you'll see in the next slide, huge improvements have been achieved across all the areas of concern, and I would say none resemble what they looked like back in the 1980s. As you can see in these pictures, significant areas of fish and wildlife habitat have been reestablished. Bald eagles have returned to several areas of concern. Walleye are being caught in previously unthinkable places like Hamilton Harbor. Natural shorelines and wetlands have been reestablished, and wildlife like the rare Blandings turtle are returning. John's now going to tell you about some of the progress in the Canadian areas of concern. So other than tacos, uh, good progress is being made in Canada. Earlier this year, five BUIs and three AOCs were redesignated to not impaired status. These are restrictions on dredging activities and degradation of benthos in the Toronto Region AOC, degradation of aesthetics in the Canadian St. Clair AOC, and beach closures and degradations, degradation of aesthetics in the Canadian Detroit River area of concern. Working with Ontario, 
One of our primary goals is to, by 2019, complete all restoration actions for delisting the St. Lawrence River at Cornwall, Bay of Quinney on Lake Ontario, the Canadian portion of the Niagara River, and the Peninsula Harbor and Nipigon Bay AOCs on Lake Superior. Speaking of the Nipigon Bay AOC, all of the actions called for in its remedial action plan have been completed. Our science and monitoring results show that BUI restoration targets have been met. The townships of Nipigon and Red Rock are in support. And we're now working to complete consultations prior to delisting. I don't expect you to read this slide. <laughs> the point is the color. The Canadian AOCs are listed on the vertical left axis and the 14 beneficial uses are across the top. Impaired beneficial uses are red, restored are green. You can see that there still is more red than green across all the Canadian AOCs. Of the 146 beneficial uses that were initially determined to be impaired, 65 have met their delisting criteria delisting criteria and are now considered not impaired, 10 in the last three years. This leaves today 81 as impaired across all of the Canadian AOCs. The greens are catching up and soon will pass the reds. We expect to redesignate another dozen BOIs to not impaired status in the next 18 months. I'd now like to expand on some of the highlights we reported in the progress report of the parties, starting with the remediation of contaminated sediments. Contaminated sediments are a pervasive problem in the areas of concern and have contributed to many beneficial use impairments, including fish tumors, degradation of benthos, restrictions on dredging, restrictions on fish consumption, and so on. 15 of the 17 Canadian and Canadian binational AOCs have or have had contaminated sediment issues. The good news is that contaminated sediment management plans are now in place or are in the process of being implemented in 12 of the 15 areas of concern. Comprehensive contaminated sediment management option studies have led to the implementation of monitored natural recovery strategies in the St. Lawrence, Bay of Quinney, and Niagara River areas of concern. A project to remove the contaminated sediments from Turkey Creek and restore this water course in the Canadian Detroit River AOC was completed in 2008. In 2012, Environment and Climate Change Canada, in partnership with the Ontario Ministry of the Environment and Climate Change, and a previous owner of the local pulp mill implemented a $7 million project to construct a thin layer cap over 23 hectares of mercury contaminated sediments in the Peninsula Harbor AOC on Lake Superior. The cap is expected to advance natural recovery by 75 years and a post-construction monitoring study in 2013 confirmed that the stability of the cap was as expected. We'll be going back in to assess whether natural revegetation of the capped area has been successful, thus showing recovery, which is what we anticipate. And if so, it will help move this AOC to delisting by 2019. The $138.9 million Randall Reef Contaminated Sediment Remediation Project in Hamilton Harbor is the largest such project ever undertaken on the Canadian side of the Great Lakes and will make a substantial contribution towards restoration of several BUIs and delisting of this AOC. This project was made possible by a public-private sector partnership involving Canada, Ontario, the Hamilton Port Authority, the City of Hamilton, U.S. Steel Canada, the City of Burlington, and Halton Region. It will be accomplished in three stages, with the first stage being to construct a six hectare double-walled engineered containment facility, or ECF, to contain nearly 700,000 cubic meters of polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbon contaminated sediments. The project started in September of 2015 with the reconstruction of an adjacent pier necessary to facilitate dredging later in the project, and that's shown in green in the drawing on the slide and in the upper right photo. This part of the project is now complete. 
In April of this year, we work began to construct the first half of the ECF, shown in red in the slide and in the lower right photo. Approximately 1,700 sheet piles were driven and we're now in the process of removing the sediment from between the ECF walls and backfilling the space with rock. This is what the ECF looks like today. Construction of the second half of the ECF will begin next spring and is expected to be complete by the end of next year. Dredging of the surrounding sediments and placement into the ECF will occur in 2018 and 19, following which the, the ECF will be dewatered and capped. When complete in 2022, it will be turned over to the Hamilton Port Authority who will develop it as a port facility and will monitor it and maintain it in perpetuity. Looking to the future, work is underway to define the management actions required for contaminated sediments in the St. Clair River, St. Mary's River, and Thunder Bay areas of concern. The harbour in the Port Hope area of concern is contaminated with low-level radioactive waste. The Government of Canada's Port Hope Area Initiative is planning to remove these sediments and restore the harbour by about 2019 as part of the $1.2 billion cleanup of contamination in and around the town of Port Hope on Lake Ontario. Many projects have been undertaken to restore fish and wildlife habitat. Here are a few highlights. The Toronto Cell 2 Wetland Creation Project is a $2.3 million project to transform the second cell, and that's shown in the top photo, of the three cell confined disposal facility for sediments dredged from the Keating Channel on Toronto's waterfront into 9.3 hectares of prime wetland. The funding partners on this project are Environment and Climate Change Canada, Coca-Cola Canada, Toronto Region Conservation Authority, the, Port of, the Toronto Port Authority, and Fisheries and Oceans Canada. Construction began in 2014, and you can see the in the middle and the upper right fo photos the progress of dewatering and installation of the wetland features. The project is nearly complete, as shown on the lower left, and was recently announced by the partners as shown in the lower right photo. The Fighting Island Sturgeon Spawning Reef in the Detroit River is one of our biggest habitat success stories. It received the Department of Interior's Partners in Conservation Award in 2013. This binational project was undertaken by Environment and Climate Change Canada, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry, DTE Energy, the U.S. Geological Survey, and the Essex Region Conservation Authority. The project was implemented in 2008 and was an immediate success with Lake Sturge and other sport fish using it. In 2013-14, we went back with our partners and extended the reef further. The reef is making a significant contribution to the restoration of fish populations in the Detroit River. Environment and Climate Change Canada has been working for some time now to support the Walpole, First, Walpole Island First Nations efforts to restore the wetlands in the St. Clair River Delta, including Swan Lake Marsh. The St. Clair River Delta is in the St. Clair River area of concern and is one of the most biologically diverse areas in Canada. Beginning in 2012 and using traditional knowledge and input from the community, a five-year plan was established and is currently in the process of being implemented. The experience and knowledge gained through this project will be applied to future habitat restoration projects within the community. Other projects I'd like to highlight are the continuing efforts to restore fish and wildlife habitat in the Coots Paradise in the Hamilton Harbour area of concern, the restoration of Kama Creek in the Nipigon Bay AOC, a project that was undertaken with Confederation College partly as an, a hands-on teaching exercise to restore the McIntyre River in Thunder Bay and the continuing efforts to restore the shoreline of the Detroit River. Looking to the future, key remaining actions planned to restore fish and wildlife habitat and related beneficial use impairments include the St. Mary's River Habitat Project with the Batchewana First Nation, which will expand fish habitat at Whitefish Island, implementing the Detroit River Habitat Strategy, strategy 
and a project in the Toronto area concern to transform the existing mouth of the Don River into a healthier, more naturalized river outlet to Lake Ontario while also enhancing flood protection. Huge progress has been made over the past few years to improve or eliminate municipal effluent discharges in the Canadian AOCs. Management efforts now are incre increasingly shifting to non-point sources of nutrients and urban stormwater. Here are a few highlights. Two projects that will contribute significantly to the Hamilton Harbour Remedial Action Plan's nutrient targets are upgrades to tertiary treatment systems at the Skyway and the Wood Woodward wastewater treatment plants. The $154 million Skyway plant upgrade was completed earlier this year. The $320 million project to upgrade the Woodward plant in Hamilton is now in the design stage with construction to start later this year. It will be one of the, the most advanced tertiary treatment plants in the country when it comes online in 2021. The City of Toronto is spending $40 million per year as part of its wet weather flow master plan to improve the management of stormwater and eliminate combined sewer overflows. These projects have and will continue to significantly improve water quality on the City's Lake Ontario waterfront and, have, and has contributed to eight of the City's 11 beaches now being blue flag beaches, which is an international certification of water quality and environmental management practices. Other recent municipal wastewater management projects include upgrades to the Amherstburg plant to tertiary treatment in the Detroit River AOC, upgrades to the Cornwall plant secondary treatment system in St. Lawrence, the combined sewer, sewer overflow retention uh, tank project on the Windsor's waterfront in the Detroit River AOC, and the project to upgrade the town of Nipigan's plant to secondary treatment in the Nipigan Bay AOC. In terms of key future challenges, the Bay of Quinte phosphorus reduction strategy is one of our biggest challenges. Significant management of non-point sources will be required to bring phosphorus levels below the remedial action plan target, which is the red line shown on the graph in the screen in front of you. Science and monitoring is a large and important part of the effort to restore the Canadian AOCs to define the problem, help identify restoration targets, determine the remedial actions, and assess their success. It's an iterative process that involves scientists from many disciplines and many organizations. In my final slides, I will describe some of the highlights in science, monitoring, and BUI assessments. Fish tumors and other deformities have been a problem in nine of the 17 Canadian AOCs are, are mainly the result of contaminants in water and sediment working their way up the food chain. Restoration targets have been achieved in five AOCs and they have been redesignated as not impaired. We anticipate that two more will soon be redesignated to not impaired status and that will leave only two AOCs on the Canadian side. Hamilton and St. Mary's River with the, this impairment. And in these AOCs, the incidence of fish tumors appears, at least right now, to be declining. Restoration of the degradation of fish habitat and fish populations, BUIs, are one of the Toronto and Region AOC's Remedial Action Plan's biggest challenges. A very interesting project is now underway in Toronto Harbour which is using fish, tele, uh, fish acoustic telemetry to track the movement of individual fish through implanted fish tags, and you can see the surgery on a pike in the top photo. Transmitters have been implanted in more than 300 fish, and signals are picked up by 36 receivers positioned on the lake bed. The data is enabling habitat managers to target important and limiting habitats to improve the effectiveness of restoration projects. A similar initi initiative is now underway in Hamilton Harbour. Eleven of the 17 Canadian and Canadian binational AOCs have had this impairment at one time when their beaches were frequently closed by water quality conditions, usually by E. coli levels. Eight AOCs currently have this impairment. 
Today, with improved municipal wastewater management and beach management practices, conditions have improved substantially. The beach closures BUI was redesignated to not impaired status earlier this year in the Canadian Detroit River AOC. I'll also note that eight of Toronto's 11 beaches are now blue flag beaches, a significant accomplishment. Now, over to Wendy and the U.S. areas of concern. Thanks, Jen. Good progress is being made in U.S. areas of concern as well. To date, four U.S. areas of concern have been delisted, the Oswego River and Harbor in New York a number of years ago, and the Presque Isle Bay in Pennsylvania and the White Lake and Deer Lake, both in Michigan since the start of the new Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement in 2012. In addition, all cleanup and restoration actions necessary for delisting have been completed at seven areas of concern, including Presque Isle Bay, White Lake, and Deer Lake, but also at the Sheboygan River, Ashtabula River, Waukegan Harbor, and St. Clair River. And we are keeping our fingers crossed, but we expect to complete all cleanup and restoration actions necessary for delisting at four additional areas of concern by the end of 2016, at the Menominee River, River Raisin, Rochester Embayment, and St. Mary's River. Our longer term goal is to complete all cleanup and restoration actions necessary for delisting at an additional six areas of concern between 2017 and 2019. If we, if we succeed, more than half or 17 of the U.S. areas of concern will be well on their way towards delisting. Like John, I don't expect you to be able to read this side, but focus on the colors. Again, the green indicates that the beneficial use impairment has been removed and the red indicates that the beneficial use is still impaired. Of the 255 beneficial uses um, that were initially determined to be impaired, currently 65 have met criteria for removal, leaving 190 um, still to be addressed. Majority of these improvements, 55 of them, have been restored since 2010. Our goal is to remove an additional 20 impairments by the end of 2019. So while we've made significant progress, on restoring beneficial use impairments in the recent years, given the amount of red that's still present on this chart, we still have a ways to go before we can declare victory. Majority of the work in areas of concern has been addressing contaminated sediments, restoring habitat, and monitoring to determine when beneficial use impairments have been restored. While it's not possible to cover in depth all the great work that's going on in all of the U.S. areas of concern, it might be helpful to take a glimpse at some of the work that has been completed or is underway. Uh, legacy pollution resulted in contaminated sediments in many of the areas of concern in the U.S. This contamination resulted in many beneficial use impairments, including degradation of benthos, restrictions on dredging, restrictions on fish consumption, and so on. The Great Lakes Legacy Act, which was passed in 2002, and the subsequent launching of the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative in 2010, have been critical to the U.S.'s ability to advance sediment remediation in many areas of concern through partnerships with non-federal entities, including industry, states, and other local entities. To date, EPA has invested over $338 million through the Great Lakes Legacy Act to leverage an additional $227 million from non-federal entities to remediate over 4 million cubic yards of contaminated sediment. So let's take a quick look at some of these projects. In the Milwaukee estuary area of concern, the US EPA partnered with the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources and Milwaukee County Parks to clean up Lincoln Park. This approximately $26 million project removed 119,000 cubic yards of contaminated sediment during the first phase of the project and provided a wider channel and riparian quarter improvements. The habitat restoration was actually completed at the same time that the sediment excavation portion of the project was done. It included the stabilization of the banks and shaping of the bottom of the channels along with the planting of hundreds of individual native trees and shrubs, native grasses and non-woody plants. Four years after the completion of the dredging, native plants have taken hold of the riparian zone along the Milwaukee River as you can see in this picture and resulted in 11 acres of habitat restoration. U.S. EPA again partnered with the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources and the Milwaukee County Parks to complete an additional sediment cleanup in this, this area of concern in the vicinity of the Esterbrook Park Dam. During this phase, 52,000 cubic yards of contaminated sediments were removed by dry excavation and hydraulic dredging and 
with shoreline habitat restoration to follow. The sediment excavation work was completed in 2015, while the habitat restoration work is going to continue into 2017. The Sheboygan River Area of Concern is a very good example of how we are using different regulatory authorities to achieve cleanup. There were four distinct sediment projects that together resulted in completing the sediment remediation work in this area of concern in 2012. The first was a, a Superfund project that removed 53,000 cubic yards of PCB contaminated sediment. The second was an additional Superfund project near the former Camp Marina manufactured gas plant that removed 24,000 cubic yards of PAH contaminated sediment. A U.S. Army Corps of Engineers project that removed 170,000 cubic yards of PCB contaminated sediment from the navigation channel. And finally, an approximate $30 million Great Lakes Legacy Act project that partnered U.S. EPA with Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources, the City of Sheboygan, Sheboygan County, Wisconsin Public Service Corporation, and Pollution Risk Services to remove an additional 147,000 cubic yards of PCB and PAH contaminated sediment. In the River Raisin area of concern, dredging is currently underway through a partnership between U.S. EPA, Michigan Department of Environmental Quality, and the Ford Motor Company. Hydraulic dredging has been ongoing throughout the summer of 2016, and capping is to follow in the next few weeks, resulting in all the cleanup and restoration actions in this area of concern being completed this year. The dredge vessel depicted in the photo is using a series of curtains to control the movement of sediment while the dredging takes place. Monitoring is also occurring outside the curtains to ensure final particles of sediment are not moving as well. This illustrates the amount of planning and design work that's needed to execute these types of projects in a safe manner. So you might ask what happens to all that sediment that gets removed. Typically if sediment is hydraulically dredged, the watery sediment mixture is piped to a processing area to be dried. These photos depict the sediment processing area used for a project in the Maumee River area of concern. 250,000 cubic yards of sediment needed to be dewatered from this particular project. In this, in this case, they're using a technology referred to as geo, geotubes. Geotubes are a permeable tube that allows the water to drain out but keep the sediment in. From the aerial photo, you can see just how large of an area is needed to manage dredge sediment and the complexity of the operations. Sometimes sediment is mechanically dredged as well, resulting in the removed sediment needing to be barged to land, again, to be dewatered so that you can reduce your transport and disposal costs of the sediment itself. No matter whether sediment is hydraulically dredged or mechanically dredged, all of the water that's, that is removed from the sediment is contained, monitored, and treated before it's released back into a water body or sent to a wastewater treatment plant for further treatment. Let's now turn to the restoration of fish and wildlife habitat and populations. There are many reasons why fish and wildlife habitat is degraded or lost, including legacy pollution or urbanization. Through the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative, we have been able to significantly improve habitat in many areas of concern. Along with US EPA, a number of federal Great Lakes Restoration Initiative agencies have partnered with state and local entities to take the lead on habitat restoration projects with great success to date. So let's take a look at some of these projects. Seven sites were identified for habitat restoration in the White Lake area of concern. US EPA provided a $2.1 million grant to complete these projects, and when finished, subsequent monitoring indicated positive environmental results resulting in the area of concern being delisted in 2014. What you see here is the start of the work at the Whitehall Causeway site between Whitehall and Montague. This is the most prominent site at the area of concern because it's in a high traffic area between the two towns and the marina just sits to the right of this picture. And here's what it looks like today. The native plants have taken hold and replaced the invasive species that once dominated this area. At the Deer Lake area of concern, completing two projects along Partridge Creek resulted in the area of concern being delisted in 2014. In 1981, fish in Deer Lake were discovered to have concentrations of mercury, resulting in a ban on total consumption by the state of Michigan. Through the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative, the city of Ishmaing initially received a $2 million grant to complete an initial phase of the project to daylight about 600 feet of Partridge Creek and reduce long-term mercury loading to Deer Lake. A subsequent Great Lakes Restoration Initiative grant to the city of Ishpeming for an additional $4 million allowed the city to complete the downstream diversion of Partridge, Partridge Creek, resulting in enhanced water quality and eliminating the last known source of mercury to Deer Lake. 
In 2013, approximately 6.5 million of habitat restoration work was completed in the Sheboygan River area of concern. Restoration work included in-stream fish habitat improvements such as fish shelf, aquatic plantings and rock piles for fish refuge, sand and gravel for spawning habitat, along with shoreline stabilization and control and removal of invasive species such as Phragmites. Completing these actions have, are collectively expected to have a positive economic impact on both tourism and boating in the Sheboygan area. Roxana Marsh is an area in the Grand Calumet area of concern that was impacted by both sediment contamination as well as significant growth of Phragmites and invasive species. The presence of Phragmites had significantly reduced plant diversity and diminished the presence and diverse wildlife species in the area. In order to restore this area, the project involved both sediment cleanup as well as work to restore the habitat. There was 123,000 cubic yards of contaminated sediment removed from the river and 109,000 cubic yards of contaminated sediment and 20 acres of Phragmites removed from the marsh area itself. This $52 million investment at the Roxana Marsh by EPA and the Indiana Department of Natural Resources is expected to result in improved habitat and a safer environment for both people and the wildlife. In the St. Mary's River area of concern, there is a key habitat restoration project currently under construction. When complete, over 70 acres of rapids will be in place in this location, which will provide the habitat needed to reintroduce Lake Whitefish and Lake Herring back in this fishery. This project will also increase the opportunity for other fish species to forage, spawn, and nurse in this newly created habitat. This restoration project is expected to lead to the removal of the two fish and wildlife habitat beneficial use impairments on the U.S. side of this binational area of concern. And we expect the construction of this project to be completed by the end of 2016. Habitat loss and overfishing in the Menominee River area of concern led to a dramatic decline in sturgeon populations. Several projects have been completed to reestablish fish passage from the lower Menominee River to historic spawning and rearing habitat 20 mile, 21 miles upstream, um, which two dams are currently impeding. Two of the projects were funded by the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative through the Sustain Our Great Lakes program for $3 million. In addition, North American Hydro added nearly a million dollars to the project. Long-term outcomes expected from this project include restored fish passage and an increase of up to 20,000 sturgeon within a 50 to 100 years. One of the more unique projects was the construction of a fish elevator, which actually allows for the sturgeon to be collected and transported around the dam structure. Science and monitoring is a large and important part of the efforts to restore U.S. areas of concern. It's critical that we define the problems as accurately as possible so we can define what actions need to be completed, the restoration targets that need to be achieved, and the estimated cost of implementing the actions. So another key component of the work going on in areas of concern are the studies and the engineering designs. Study, studies typically include sampling from multiple media, sediment, water, biota such as fish or benthos, as well as the use of evaluative tools such as modeling to help define the problems. Sometimes these studies can be, can, can be, excuse me, can be completed in a short period of time like six months, but usually they take longer with the average being somewhere between 18 months to two years. Ensuring cleanup and restoration actions are built correctly is essential. This means that even after we've identified a cleanup and or restoration action to be implemented in an area of concern, we need to plan and design exactly how that action will be built. While some designs can be completed again in a short period of time like six months, typically designing a project can take anywhere from one to two years. Science also plays a significant role in demonstrating that restoration has actually happened in areas of concern after cleanup and restoration actions are built. That means we need to assess the effect effectiveness of the actions completed in relation to the beneficial uses we want to restore in a particular area of concern. Assisting with these assessments, federal agencies such as the U.S. Geologic Survey or USGS may assess plankton or fish populations while the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA, may assist with assessing benthic or bottom-dwelling organisms. 
Here's an example on the St. Clair River where artificial spawning reefs were recently built to restore the natural spawning habitat and enhance reproductive su success in the wild. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, U.S. Coast Guard, Michigan Department of Natural Resources, U.S. EPA, and local charter captains are actually collaborating on a tag recapture study of sturgeon. To date, results indicate that installed streambed spawning reefs are being utilized and lake sturgeon populations are now at about 30,000 individuals. Another example is NOAA's Great Lakes Muscle Watch Program, which is one of several projects of contaminant monitoring with Great Lakes basin-wide coverage. Mussels are filter-feeding bottom dwellers, which bioaccumulate contaminants, possess limited ability to metabolize contaminants, are representative of local conditions, shed light on bioavailability contaminants in higher trophic levels, and serve as surrogates for benthic and wildlife health. These characteristics make them an excellent tool for contamination monitoring and assessment. The data from this program we are using currently to assess the effectiveness of cleanup and restoration actions in areas of concern. Now that you've had an opportunity to see a snapshot of the cleanup and restoration activities both in Canada and the U.S., along with their partners um, that, that their partners have been working diligently on, let's talk about what we have identified as the priorities going forward. For areas of concern, the priorities for science and action will continue to remain focused on implementing remedial actions to restore beneficial uses and monitoring and scientific assessments necessary to verify restoration of beneficial uses prior to delisting areas of concern. I'd like to thank you for your time today and hope that you've enjoyed our presentation.